going on? Welcome in the Matt Bernier Show, DRFTV, live.drf.com, livestream.com, the Daily Racing Forms Twitter handle that would be at DRF Inside Post, as well as the Daily Racing Forms Facebook page. My name is Matt Bernier. You can follow me on Twitter at Bernier underscore Matt. This is the recap edition of the Matt Bernier Show, taking a look back at racing from this past weekend. It would have been March the 31st. Big racing at Gulfstream Park, big racing out in Dubai. We'll dive into all that and then some. If you check this thing out, podcast. You've got YouTube, video.drf.com, iTunes, and SoundCloud. A number of ways for you to check this whole thing out. Most of you check it out, podcast version. Thank you for doing so. Let's dive right into it right at the top. It's that time of year. We'll start with the three-year-olds in South Florida. Then we'll shift our attention out to Dubai. We'll go over a few races, and then we'll come back to Gulfstream, wrap things up. As we always do, we'll also have a stakes montage for the things that we unfortunately couldn't get to this weekend as far as full in-depth recaps. And then we'll obviously get you into the weekend's best buyer performances, a little bit of a DRF TV schedule of events for the rest of this week because it is a big week. Three 100-point derby preps coming up on Saturday afternoon, and then we'll get you ready to go for some other things coming up the rest of the week. So first things first, let's dive into the Grade 1 Florida Derby. This was the field running down at Gulfstream Park, a mile and an eighth on the main track. Three-year-olds, 100 points would go to the winner. You would lock up a spot in the starting gate the first Saturday in May, a field of nine signed on. Heck, even if you run second, you're probably going to be good enough with the 40 points that would be awarded there. The post-time favorite was Todd Pletcher's audible, winning the Holy Bull. He had been gone since that race. This was the plan all along. Give him some time, bring him back in the Florida Derby, have him cranked up, and then get ready to roll into Louisville and find out what you've got as far as new faces and fresh faces in this race. You had Catholic Boy for Jonathan Thomas, very impressive winner of the Remsen as a two-year-old. A little bit disappointing when he came back in the Sam F. Davis. All the eggs were in this basket. He needed to win or run second in order to get in to the Kentucky Derby. You also had strike power and promises fulfilled, the two-and-one or one-two runners coming out of the Fountain of Youth. They figured to take money in here. They went off at 9-2 to two and 7-1, to one respectively. Unfortunately for fans of those horses or people that bet them, they were the ones that set this thing up for everyone and their brother because the pace was incredible the way it unfolded. And this is how the entire thing shook down Pete Aiello with the stretch run to the Florida Derby the top of the stretch. Audible let loose on the outside to take the lead from Mississippi who's back to second. Hofberg straightens up and tries to finish up with less than an eighth of a mile to go. It's the Holy Bull winner. Audible who's clear. Audible by three. Hofberg can't get him. Mississippi is third. Five Florida Derbies for Todd Pletcher. Audible, no doubt about it. He won it by two. Audible and Todd Pletcher get the job done. I believe it is Todd Pletcher's fifth victory in the Florida Derby. He wins, pays $5.20. Hofberg, the lightly raced horse for Bill Mott, runs second, $7.20 to place. And the number nine, Mississippi, runs third, $5 to show. $1 exact at $25.40. 50 cent trifecta comes back, seventy-seven thirty-five. And the 10 cent superfecta, if you just took the outside four horses and boxed them, if you were good to go, the 10 cent super comes back, $46.30. Audible is a three-year-old. He is Four of five lifetime. He's never been out of the money. He's earned over $882,000 in career earnings. Owned by China Horse Club, Head of Plains Partners, LLC, Starlight Racing, and Windstar Farm. Trained, obviously, by Todd Pletcher. Bred by Oak Bluff Stables, LLC. He's a New York bred. Ridden to victory by John Velasquez, and you can see the pedigree at the bottom of the page. He's by Into Mischief, Into Mischief excuse me, out of a gilded time mare named Blue Devil Bell. Audible earns a 99 buyer speed figure in a 122 time form U.S. rating. For what it's worth, the way this race was run, and you look at the fractions, 21 and 4, 46 and 1. Understandably, the opening quarter and the half mile splits were color coded red as far as time form U.S. was concerned. Uh, Audible did a lot of things well here, and I like that he was a little bit more professional than he was in the Holy Bull. I didn't like the fact that he was early with the lead change on the far turn, popped back to his left lead at the wire. Those are things that don't necessarily get my juices flown and don't get me excited about the long-term prospects of a horse, and particularly also about going longer distances. This time around, he was much more professional, got his final eighth of a mile in 12-2. and two. I think it's very important to note the final eighth of a mile for the runners in this race because there were only two that were sub-13. And guess what? Not only were they sub-13, they were markedly faster than sub-13. You had Audible who came home in 12.52, and you had Hofberg who came home in 12.69. Uh, we'll dive into Hofberg a little bit more momentarily. Audible really hasn't done a heck of a lot wrong, as we saw by that overall body of work. He's 4 or 5, and he's only missed one other time. My big concern with this horse, 
I, it's nice that he's paired up 99s, the, the 99 in the Holy Bull, the 99 here in the Florida Derby. This is something that I'm sure a lot of people uh, that listen to this or hear about this, me say this, they may roll their eyes and others may take it a little bit too seriously. I found the gallop out to be very, very bizarre. You go back and watch the pan view because the head on, they cut it relatively quickly after the wire. The pan, this horse, John Velasquez gets him pulled up rather quickly and his head is cocked off to the side. That, that's not, you, I don't usually see horses gallop out like that. Um, I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with the horse. It just, to me, I don't know. It's not what I want to see leading into the Kentucky Derby. It's not what I want to see with a horse that still has another eighth of a mile to go. Now, again, to try to squash that sort of fear, he did come home faster than any other horse in the entire race. So maybe it's a lot to do about nothing. Some people will overreact to that. I think some people will underreact to that. It's something that I'm filing away. I'm not saying I won't pick him in the Kentucky Derby. We'll find out. We've still got a lot of racing to go between now and the first Saturday in May, but it's at least something to, to file away in your memory. And if you haven't seen it, you can go back and watch. If you pull it up into Formulator or you use RTN or you use any of these other things to stream your videos, pull up the entirety of that stretch run and the gallop out. We didn't see it here in this replay, but it was a little bit odd. And that's all I'll say. It, for me, it's just something that I'm going to keep note of. But at the end of the day, this is a horse that has really done nothing wrong. And Pletcher looks about as strong as he ever has heading into Kentucky. We'll find out because it sounds like he's going to have more runners coming up this weekend, whether it's in New York or Kentucky or both. And then he's certainly going to have more runners the following weekend in Arkansas, most notably Magnum Moon. So it's good to be Todd Pletcher right now. It's good to be John Velasquez. Good to be those connections with the three-year-old. What else is new? It's been like that for the past 20 years. Hofberg, I liked Hofberg. I picked him in this race, and I thought he ran really well, considering this is his third lifetime start, second start of the season, and second start off of a long, long layoff. Um, I really thought he did a lot of things good here. You saw Jose Ortiz get into him a little bit on the far turn. He started warming up. I wonder if Jose could have done it again. It looked like he was going to try to dive to the inside as they got to about the eighth pole, and he angled him back out into the clear. Wouldn't have made a difference because he lost by three lengths, but I like the way that he finished through the wire, and we've talked about the pedigree with this horse. He's by Tappet. He's a half to a Malliant, who's a grade one winner, going very long, going a mile and a quarter, mile and an eighth. Distance is only going to be Hofberg's friend. Bill Mott has said if it's the right thing to do, if we think it's the right thing to do with the horse, we'll go to the Kentucky Derby. We talked about it. Mott is, is historically conservative. He'll run the horses where he thinks they belong when he thinks they are ready to run there. The fact that he ran this horse in the Florida Derby off of a maiden score in a second start off of a long layoff, to me, goes to show you what he thinks of this horse. He also had a quote saying, it wouldn't have surprised him at all if this horse had won the Derby. So, or the Florida Derby. He clearly thinks that this horse can run. On paper, he looks like he can run. And visually, when you see him, he looks like he can run. I have a, I wonder. It's too early to tell. And, and again, it makes it sound like I'm knocking audible, but I'm not. I wonder if it's all said and done, the best horse that ran in this race ultimately will be Hofberg because he has the pedigree, he has the connections, and he just looks like a serious talent. He earned a 94 buyer and a 118 time form U.S. rating. Mississippi, I think, is going to get lost a little bit in the shuffle here. Thought he ran very, very well in this race. The buyer will, won't suggest that with an 82. The time form rating is a little bit kinder with a 112. And he crawled home in th almost 14 seconds in his final eighth of a mile. But the reason I think he ran really well is because you had those two breakaway horses that just went off and set unbelievable early splits. And that was Strike Power and Promises Fulfilled, the one-two runners coming out of that fountain of youth. But everybody and their brother knew that Promises Fulfilled was going to go. Dale Romans has said it, live by the sword, die by the sword. They were going to try to make the front. Strike Power down on the inside, they didn't want to relinquish it. Uh, Louis Saez, I don't think they did anything wrong. It's a situation where if you let Promises Fulfilled just walk on the front end, are you going to have a replay of what we saw in the Fountain of Youth? So I don't think anybody was wrong there. I just think that's how this entire thing played out. Bringing it back to Mississippi. Mississippi was the first one to make a move into that pace. Going down the backside, he quickly got up within about two or three lengths, and I thought he ran really well. The fact that he hung around to run third when really everyone else that was forward finished up the track. You look at Storm Runner, you look at Strike Power, you look at uh, Promises Fulfilled, they were one, two, and four at the half mile and the three-quarter call or three-quarter pull. You look at it here, Mississippi was three, 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 three the entire way. I think he ran a big, big race. I don't know if he one, I don't think he's gonna get into the Kentucky Derby, but he's the kind of horse that I think is gonna look 
a little bit less than he actually is on paper. I thought this was probably the best race of his career. That's including the run against uh, Noble Indy, which he ran second in by a nose. Noble Indy obviously came back to win the Louisiana Derby. I I thought this was a really good effort from Mississippi, something that you can build on going forward. Maybe not a derby horse, but there are races for Mississippi down the road, I believe. And uh, the last one we will really touch on in depth. We'll briefly touch on those bottom also runs. Um, Catholic boy, very disappointing in here at face value. He was in a beautiful position, and he just never really quickened, never finished. Uh, we found out after the race that he bled pretty seriously, and he's going to be laid up for some time. And they have also said the connections when he comes back, any surfaces in play, dirt or turf, uh, the 80 buyer, the 109 time form U.S. rating, certainly not what uh, some people were expecting. He went off as the second choice. Uh, but again, he had a, he has an excuse now that he bled pretty severely in this race. He's going to be gone for some time. We'll find out wherever he comes back and whatever surface he comes back on. Hopefully he is as good as he was. There is a part of me, if you want to call it cold-hearted, knowing that he had a physical issue here in this race. I'm, I'm starting to wonder, has he really taken a step forward? And this isn't... This isn't it sounds bad because this is not the race to make that determination on because again, there was a physical problem, but I, I, you couple that a little bit with what happened within the Sam F Davis, where he just kind of flat down the lane. And if you just look at it from a speed figure standpoint, he hasn't run any faster than he did as a two year old when he won that Remsen. again, this is, this race is probably not the right one to be making a call one way or the other, what you think about this horse on, but it is just something to file away when he does come back. He'll be coming back off of a, a physical problem, and he'll be coming back with a horse that really hasn't gotten any faster yet anyway. And again, I know he's only run one and a half, if you want to call it a half run, but um, Catholic boy, hopefully he'll come back soon enough and be ready to go. Uh, strike power, I think he's probably going to be better off going shorter. Storm runner, never really understood all the hype with him. He didn't run well here. Promises fulfilled. It sounds like they're going to go to the Kentucky Derby. They've got the points. Why not? I believe he is on a van to head up to Churchill Downs sometime this afternoon. This is being recorded on Monday. Um, Dale Roman says, look, we're going to go on with it. And you know what his running style is going to be. He'll be forward. So you know there's at least one horse that's going to be out there setting the pace in the Kentucky Derby. If he gets there, knock on wood, hopefully everything sounds good. Uh, Promises fulfilled. Sounds like they are going to go on with it. But Audible is the big winner in the Grade 1 Florida Derby. He gets 100 qualifying points. He is in. He is going to be one of the favorites the first Saturday in May for Todd Pletcher. 99 buyer, 122 time form U.S. rating. The runner-up, Hofberg, a 94 buyer, a 118 time form U.S. rating. And if it's the right move for the horse, they'll go on to the Kentucky Derby, according to Bill Mott. If not, maybe they pull back a little bit. Wouldn't shock me at all if you saw a horse like this show up in the Belmont Stakes. Let's go out to May Dan and take a look at the big one on Dubai World Cup night. It was the $10 million Dubai World Cup. You had a field of 10 signed on in here. All eyes were on Bob Baffert's West Coast. He also sent over Mubtahij, who was well-versed with the May Dan main track. But this was a horse in West Coast that I think a lot of people expected it to just be a complete walkover on the heels of a runner-up finish in the Pegasus World Cup behind uh, gun runner and then two starts back in the Breeders' Cup Classic, running third behind gun runner as well as collected. West Coast is going to take a world of beating in here, but there were things that you had to throw in there and factor in. First time shipping across overseas, first time facing horses of this caliber, excluding Gunrunner, and just there were a lot of things. Racing without Lasix, you never know until they actually do it. Baffert said as much on the international broadcast prior to the race, but he was going to be the horse to beat. And then you had the rest of the American contingent. You had Pavel in here for Doug O'Neill. You had Forever Unbridled taking on the boys for Dallas Stewart. We mentioned Moob Tahiz. You had Gunavera coming over as well. He'd be doing his best running late. Did any of our Americans get the job done? No. Here's the stretch run of the Dubai World Cup. I went for home. Sumion gave us some leather inside the final 300. Thunder Snows out by three, four lengths over West Coast. Down the outside, Forever Unbridled, Mukta Hitch. Then Pavilus Thunder Snow, well clear in the Dubai World Cup. Thunder Snow, the Derby winner, is racing away. Trying to get there is West Coast battling away, but a brilliant performance. Thunder Snow, a massive upset in the Dubai World Cup. Thunder Snow. Thunder Snow is the winner of the $10 million Dubai World Cup for the home team, Godolphin. We'll dive into the connections and everything momentarily. He is the winner over the runner-up West Coast. Disappoints as the betting favorite here in the United States and even over internationally. Obviously, there was no betting in Dubai, but internationally, West Coast was the favorite. The third-place finisher, Moop Tahiz. He likes the home cooking over there. That was where he's been based for the vast majority of his career, and he's done his best running over at Maydan. He runs third. Fourth-place finisher was Pavel for Doug O'Neill. Let's take a look at 
at the winner a little bit more. Your winner, Thunder Snow, he's 7 of 18 lifetime. He's over $8.3 million in career earnings now. He hasn't done a heck of a lot wrong in his career. He can win on turf. He can win on dirt. You name it, you throw it at him, maybe with the exception of a wet racetrack, which we saw in the Kentucky Derby last year. He'll basically run on anything. He's a really, really nice horse. He's owned by Godolphin LLC, trained by Saeed Ben Sarur, bred by Darley out of Ireland, ridden to victory by Christoph Sumian. And the pedigree at the bottom of the page, he's by Helmet, an Australian sire, and out of the Dubai destination mare named Eastern Joy. This is a nice horse, Thunder Snow. The question now becomes, where does he campaign for the rest of the season going forward? Because I would have to imagine, after a race like this, the connections have to be circling the Breeders' Cup Classic at Churchill Downs in November. Give him another shot at the main track at Churchill. Hopefully it's not a wet one like it was last year on the first Saturday in May for the Kentucky Derby. Thunder Snow's a horse that has always shown ability. Again, a Group 1 winner now on dirt and a Group 1 winner as well on turf. The, the class is there. The question was, with this race track and how everything had been playing, how would it work out for him? How would it work out for West Coast? Let's start off at the beginning of the race. When a horse like North America, who was supposed to be the pace setter, completely misses the break, the complexion of the race changed entirely. Scenario now, wide open. Who's going to be the one to go on with it? West Coast had very good position with Javier Castellano, but Javier relinquished the inside and the lead to Thundersnow and Sumian chose to get him to the outside, which I think nine times out of ten is the right move. On a racetrack like this at May Dan, which the entire meeting had been favoring speed, and we'll dive into the bias here momentarily because there was one at play, no question about it, in my opinion. I, this may have been the one instance where it was an error to get off the rail, and not just the rail, but to give up the lead, where you could have had the lead. And we've seen West Coast go fast in the past, and they weren't going fast by any stretch of the imagination. The opening quarter was slow, and you allowed Thundersnow to get out there and dictate terms, and it was just too much for them to overcome. At the same time, this probably wasn't the best West Coast has ever run. The fact that it was as close as it was for second with Muptahij, who I don't think anybody is going to make the argument that they're in the same class as far as ability is concerned, uh, it makes me just think that this was not the best West Coast performance that we've ever seen or we will ever seen and also a little bit of a tactical error as far as the ride and the racetrack and kind of looking at all that is concerned the racetrack a lot of people saying gold rail gold rail gold rail I I'm not arguing that the rail was good but I think it was much more speed than rail now generally speaking speed for the most part is inherently going to be on the rail just because you can clear off and the shortest trip around the track is the inside which very often can lead people to just look at lump them together speed rail x y and z we saw enough horses run well from just off the rail though particularly in the sprint where you had x y jet who wasn't actually cleared off to the inside and i know a lot of people were critical of haramil for giving that up we'll dive into that race more momentarily but he still was right there at the end. If this, if the rail was gold, there's no chance that he would have been there at the end. Now, you can also make that argument and say, well, yeah, but if it was such a speed-friendly racetrack, then how the heck did Mind Your Biscuits come from way out of it? Again, we'll dive into that more momentarily. But when you go back and watch this race again, sure, Thunder Snow is down on the inside, but West Coast is in the two-path. And I realize just inside is, is more broad. It's not necessarily that you got to be just glued to the rail if you're toward the inside you're in a better position but there were horses that toward the outside they they didn't really lose ground to anybody else from the inside i guess that's the big thing furia crusada is tucked in just behind thunder snow for the majority of the run if the rail was gold furia crusada doesn't finish up the racetrack and a horse like forever unbridled who's five wide the entire way she's nowhere she's nowhere if that ro if it's gold down on the inside it, it, there are too many things, and again, this is a very subjective thing, bias. Those of you listening may disagree with me entirely. Some of you may agree with me wholeheartedly. I think the racetrack at Maydan, it was much more speed than it was inside necessarily. Inside was not bad. It did not hurt to be there at all. But unless it's a terrible rail, unless it's complete slop or mud or muck, when is it ever bad to be inside? Inside, it's the shortest distance around the racetrack. It's the same thing when we hear about all these things with, you know, on a, on a air quotes, normal main track that we have in the United States where oh, speed bias, speed bias, speed bias. Well, the speed is always going to be where you want to be on dirt. You always want to be forward. It's much easier to run from the front than it is coming from the back on dirt. 
But you do get instances like this where it seems like if you're not forward, you are way up against it. And if you come from off of it, my goodness, you ran just an exceptional race, otherworldly, off the charts. Speaking of charts and figures, the buyer associates will occasionally make a special exception and make figures for this night of racing. They don't do it for Dubai for the entirety of the meet, but they'll do it for the World Cup night. Thunder Snow would have earned a 111 buyer speed figure. Stacks up pretty well with some of our better horses, but I don't know that it necessarily would make him a, a stone-cold lock for a race like the Breeders' Cup Classic, knowing that West Coast on his best day can run a 115 or has run a 115. And some of these three-year-olds, who knows what they're going to be able to do later on down the road. I think Thunder Snow is good. Also, Craig Milkowski talked about uh, a pace-adjusted unofficial ranking or rating for Thunder Snow in the Dubai World Cup of 130. So 130 is usually a very, very good number. It will win grade one races over here in the United States. If they ever chose to come over here, he would certainly be something that you would need to consider. You would need to consider him as a, a, a contender. I'm just surprised at the amount of people that were just sitting there saying he was completely implausible. I, then you clearly weren't watching the racing from May Dan over the course of the year when they ran, when he and North America ran into each other, because he was not implausible. Far from it. This was a horse that circumstances got him in that Al Maktoum round three challenge where he was on a, just a, an impossible to pass track. It was a complete highway. You got out to the front, you were gone. That's why North America won by as much as he did. I think it's part of the reason why Thunder Snow won by as much as he did and there was no passing going on behind him. It was basically a merry-go-round for the most part. Forever and Bridal made up a little bit of ground. Long story short. Thunder Snow takes advantage, a heady ride from Christoph Sumian to get over. Once North America doesn't make the break, completely misses it, he clears off, gets to the front, and takes him gate to wire, winning the Dubai World Cup. The field for the UAE Derby, a 100-point race for the Kentucky Derby. The winner is in as far as the starting gate is concerned. All eyes were on Aiden O'Brien's Mendelssohn, a three-year-old. He's a half to Beholder, a half to Into Mischief. The pedigree is there in spades. He's by Scat Daddy. And guess what? We're going to dive into all of that more after when we talk about the horse card. But this was the field. There were nine brave souls signed on. I don't think anyone anticipated the sort of effort that we got from Mendelssohn was coming. I don't think that this was sort of just a, a sign sealed delivered case with this horse. He looked tremendous on the racetrack. He's done a number of very, very impressive things, but he had to go up against some good horses, the locally based Gold Town, the U.S. based Reride, who... Heck, all he had done was won the Mind That Bird Derby with a 91 buyer, and then the horse that he defeated handily came back to win the Sunland Derby. So it's not as though he was facing a bunch of ham and eggers. Rhea, who won the UAE Oaks and is going to go over to Bob Baffert's barn and run in the UAE in the Kentucky Oaks, you know, th there were some good quality runners in here, but guess what? It, it, it was just an absolute devastating performance. Here's the stretch run of the UAE Derby. Flat to the floorboards down the outside, followed by Yearlong Warrior, Taiki Further, Ruggiero, but it is Mandelson well clear inside the final 250. It's going to make a one-act affair of the UAE Derby. Mendelssohn en route perhaps to the Kentucky Derby is going to absolutely jog up. Mendelssohn's out by 15 on Raya, battling on re-ride, followed by Goldtown, but what a win by Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn by... Mendelssohn gets the job done for Aiden O'Brien. Raya, the Philly, runs second. Reride, the American-based horse, runs third. He will not be going on to the Kentucky Derby, does not have enough points. Raya will be going on to the Kentucky Oaks. The horse that will be going on to the Kentucky Derby is Mendelssohn. Let's discuss him, take a look at the horse card. You can see he is four of seven lifetime. He is over $1.9 million in career earnings, owned by Michael B. Tabor. Mrs. John Magner and Derek Smith, trained by Aiden O'Brien, bred by Clarkland Farm in Kentucky. Ridden to victory by Ryan Moore, and we touched on the pedigree momentarily at the beginning. He is by Scat Daddy, out of a Tricky Creek mare named Leslie's Lady. Happens to be a half-brother to Beholder. Happens to be a half-brother to Into Mischief. There's a ton to like about this horse now, and I think there were some people that tweeted about it, and I have to agree. Uh, he may very well be the most valuable horse on the planet Earth right now. Uh, I don't think that's hyperbole. I don't think that's overstating it. This horse is worth his weight in gold based on his pedigree and what he's done on the racetrack thus far. Uh, let's just use, let, let's talk a little bit about a couple things. First things first, uh, the buyer associates again, they're throwing out a number for this race of 106. A 106 buyer speed figure, that is very clearly at this point to date the fastest three-year-old number that we've seen. And that's including, obviously, all of our domestic horses. 
No one has run a triple digit buyer in that vicinity. Now, does that mean that that's what's going to happen the first Saturday in May? No, not at all. Doesn't mean that, but just gives you a, a pretty good idea of what we're looking at as far as the performance from Mendelssohn. If you want to look at the fractionals, oh, and also Craig Milkowski, a 128 time form US rating, unofficial pace adjusted. If you want to look at the fractionals between Thunder Snow's Dubai World Cup and Mendelssohn's UAE Derby, first quarter, Thunder Snow 25.73, Mendelssohn 25.09, considerably faster for Mendelssohn. Half 50.43. For Thundersnow, 48.46 for Mendelssohn. I mean, we're talking 10 lengths faster. Three quarters, 113.89, 111.87. Faster Mendelssohn by, again, nearly 10. To the mile, 137 and 1, 136 and 1, 5. And then, again, the difference in the actual run of the race, a mile and a quarter versus a mile and three sixteenths. This was, to me... You can sit there and say that the success or lack thereof that the Dubai runners, the UAE Derby runners in particular, have had over here in the United States is well documented. I, that part I cannot argue, and I have no desire to argue, because that's, that's, that's fact. They just have not done very well when they've come over here. The difference is, I think anyway, that the horses that have been running over there, a horse like even, let's use Moob Tahij as an example. He... He's trained by he was trained by a very very shrewd and uh, strong trainer and Mike DeCock, based over in UAE and obviously he's run down in South Africa before and run all over the place. Aiden O'Brien though has a a long track record of doing well here in the United States and I understand his numbers outside of Breeders' Cup competition are not sparkling, but how often does he come here with a horse like this? Normally he comes over here outside of the Breeders' Cup races with the C string. Not the really good horses. He's bringing them here for a reason because they're not good enough to run with his good horses and maybe they're still good enough to beat our horses. This horse is top class no matter how you look at it, wherever you want to look at it. If he was running in Japan, England, the United States, you name it. He's, he is class on class on class. The pedigree is there. He's supposed to be able to do this. I don't think anybody thought, though, that he might be better on this by that kind of margin, and went by the length of the stretch. He was geared down, and he did it fast. I understand the racetrack was in his favor. He was forward. Ryan Moore, arguably the best jockey in the world, did what he was supposed to do, get him to the front, establish position, back it down a little bit, and then go on with it. This horse changed leads. He's not trained to change leads like that. They don't really run like that. He did it. The other thing that you got to keep in mind with this horse, why he is, he is unique. He is uncommon as far as these UAE kind of horses are concerned. He's already shipped to the United States and won. People talking about, oh, well, you know, he won this in gate-to-wire fashion, rode this, da-da-da. He sat off in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf, inherited, took this thing over, went on with it, won. There's class all over the place. I, probably, I, I, don't, I don't see anything to knock about this horse. I feel like if we are not, if you're really making a serious case to knock this horse, I feel like you're doing it because he's not one of ours, because he's over there, because he's based over in, in Europe. If he were here, if instead of Aiden O'Brien, it said Bob Baffert, this horse would be even money right now in the Kentucky Derby, as is over in England and Europe with the bookmakers. He is the favorite at the at the moment. Now a little bit, little bit of that is home cooking, but what I'm trying to say is. I I don't have I don't have any knocks about this horse. He's shipped here. He's won on turf, synthetic and dirt. He's won at a mile and three sixteenths, so clearly a mile and a quarter is not going to be a problem for him. He has tactical speed. He can go if it's given to him. He went fast in this race. Usually we see these just dawdling paces in these races, 51, 52, and I know the run up is different over there. There really is none. I, he went fast. I think this is a legitimate horse. I'm not going to sit here right now and say that I'm picking him because we have a lot coming up this weekend, and then you've got the Arkansas Derby, and there's still four weeks until the Kentucky Derby. But I would be lying to you if I said I wasn't seriously thinking that th this to me was the most impressive Kentucky Derby prep. I'm not comparing the horses. I'm just comparing the efforts. This was the most impressive visually to me anyway 
since American Pharaoh won the Arkansas Derby back in 2015. We've had a lot of prep races in between then. We've had some good performances. This one, to me, is the best since Pharaoh's Arkansas Derby. I'm not comparing the horses. Don't, don't take that the wrong way. Listen to what I'm saying. Performance-wise, this was the most impressive, in my opinion, since Pharaoh won the Arkansas Derby. I have no knocks against this horse. He's run fast. He's got great connections. He's bred for it. I don't know. I, I don't really have any knocks. He did ride a, look, the toward the inside is where he wanted to be, but he wasn't glued to the rail down the backside. He was two path off the entire way. Ryan Moore allowed the Philly down on the inside. If you want to come through, go ahead. Didn't happen. He sat, he relaxed, he shut off. He goes on again. I have, I can't find anything to knock about this horse. If you believe the 106 buyer that the boy, the uh, buyer associates threw together, makes him one of the fastest horses that we have. If you believe the 128 pace adjusted number from Craig in time form us, he's one of the fastest horses we have. Heck, he could, he could run in a grade one with older horses. If you believe those figs, I know he had a speed friendly racetrack and he rode that, but he's done things in the past that for me anyway, allay, allay the fear of, Oh, he absolutely has to have the lead. He has to do this. He has to do that. I think he's awesome. I have no knock. I can understand why people have some trepidation with a horse like this, but I think you're looking at a serious runner, and I just, fingers crossed, I really hope everything goes as planned and he comes over here because I think I think this is Aiden O'Brien, very clearly his best opportunity to win a Kentucky Derby is with this horse, Mendelssohn. He wins the UAE Derby. If you look at the buyer associates, they gave him a 106 buyer, and you look at Craig Milkowski with the time form US, unofficial number, Pace adjusted, a 128 time form U.S. rating. Mendelssohn looks like he's the goods, and it looks like he's coming over here to America for the Kentucky Derby. Midway on the card between the UAE Derby and the Dubai World Cup was the Dubai Golden Shaheen. Let's take a look at that field. A lot of familiar names here for us, the Americans. You can take a look at XY Jet. You can take a look at Roy H., the reigning Breeders' Cup sprint champion and reigning Eclipse winner for male sprinter here in the United States, as well as last year's Dubai Golden Shaheen winner, Mind your biscuits. The way that this racetrack played, I thought XY Jet had this field over a barrel. He's going to be much more forward than a horse like Roy H., certainly more forward than a horse like Mind Your Biscuits. And also just the combination of things where if you need to be forward on a racetrack like this, it's certainly favoring horses that can get to the front or forwardly placed. Boy, it's going to make it more difficult for a horse like Roy H. or certainly a horse like Mind Your Biscuits. Frankly, I didn't think Mind Your Biscuits had any chance over a racetrack like this. Also, with the combination of his local prep down at Florida at Gulfstream, I didn't love that race. Couldn't have been more wrong. Shows how much I know. Here's the stretch run of the Dubai Golden Shaheen. Came to the outside, Matera Sky for Japan is battling on well. I gap off to mind your biscuits inside the final 250. XY Jet is the front runner. Roy H having his work uh, to try and get him down the outside. It's XY Jet in front. Coming at him is Roy H. Mind your biscuits begins to fly. XY Jet, Roy H. Mind your biscuits down the outside. XY Jet, mind your biscuits. Flo got him. Mind your biscuits. Mind Your Biscuits gets the job done, runs down XY Jet in the shadow of the wire. You have to feel a little bit for the connections of XY Jet. He's run two bang-up races in three years. He's had some major physical issues, and he's just been pipped at the wire both times. Tough, tough break there, but a good effort from him to run second behind Biscuits. And third, Roy H., a disappointing effort from Roy H. I'm going to look at this race and just say it's simply very similar to what we saw with West Coast, where maybe the racetrack played a little bit into it, but at the same time, this wasn't the best Roy H we've ever seen. I, I think it was a little bit of a dud from him, and hopefully he comes back as good, if not better, than before he went over there. Let's talk about the winner, though. Mind Your Biscuits gets the job done. He is 7 of 21 lifetime, over $3.7 million in career earnings, owned by Head of Plains, LLC, Jay Stables, LLC, Summers, and Kisber, trained by Chad Summers, bred by Jumping Jack Racing, LLC, in the state of New York. We've got a couple of New York breads popping up here already. Big races here. This weekend, the jockey was Joel Rosario. The sire is Posse. The dam is Jasmine out of the horse called Tocket. And again, this is just a, a really cool horse. Mind your biscuits. He shows up and runs more often than not a good race, but he will occasionally throw in a clunker. I personally thought the return effort at Gulfstream was not good. I didn't think it would be enough to get him ready to go for a race like this, particularly considering they didn't run him again, but they had him ready to go. And I think it was even more impressive considering I think it was a, a speed-friendly racetrack, and he came from dead last. And 
this again kind of goes against the idea that inside, you know, gold rail, gold rail. Well, Joel Rosario broke and immediately got him out into the clear. So if it was a gold rail, and I know people are going to use the same argument against my argument that it was a speed racetrack, but if it was a gold rail, he would never sniffed the rail other than when he broke. It was wider than wide throughout, and he came down the center of the track like a freight train. So I think speed did well, and that's why I think this race, this performance may have been, it might have been the best of the night. And I, I still think Mendelssohn's was, but that's neither here nor there. This was an incredible effort from this horse. Giant, giant finish. He loves it over there. And it'll be interesting to see where they go with him when he comes back here. I know they tried the Cigar Mile, and he ran really well behind Sharp Azteca. Wouldn't surprise me at all if we saw him pop up in a race like the Met Mile that would be on the Belmont Stakes undercard. As far as the other two are concerned, XY Jet, big, big early speed, always dangerous in some of these six furlong sort of sprint races. And Roy H., you're probably going to go back to the West Coast, get settled in, get back to what he does best. He can run at six. He can run at six and a half. Heck, he can even run at seven. He can sit just off. He can go. I think Roy H is going to be fine. I think he just had an uncharacteristic bad night on Dubai World Cup night. But a big, big effort. Horse that did not have a bad effort on Dubai World Cup night. Arguably the best of them all was Mind Your Biscuits winning the Dubai Golden Shaheen. Let's take a look at the field for the Hardacre Mile. The Gulfstream Park Hardacre Mile. You had a field of six. Highlighted by the return of 2017 Kentucky Derby winner Always Dreaming for Todd Pletcher making his first start since the Travers of last year. Things certainly didn't go the way that I think most people anticipated they would following that win in the run for the Roses. The wheels kind of fell off after that. Three very subpar efforts. Some time off. Came back here in this spot. He went off as the 9-5 to favorite, or the co-choice anyway. The actual betting favorite was another three-year-old, newly turned four-year-old, an Irish war cry for Graham Motion. Those two took almost all the money. Tommy Macho, another strong runner for Pletcher, was your third choice in here at 5-2. to two, But none of them got the job done because they all fell asleep on the horse that he's had some rough trips recently. But if you let him get out there and dictate things on the front end, he can get brave. Here's P.I.L. with the call. It's Conquest, Big E, trying to spring the upset. He has a four-length lead with an eighth of a mile left to go. Always dreaming, can't reach him. Tommy Macho on the outside with Paige McKinney. But the upset is on. It's the local horse. It's the Hurtak horse. It's Conquest, Big E, and Jose Bautista. Geek to wire in the Gulfstream Park Mile. Conquest, Big E. Allowed to get out there, dictate the pace, dictate things on the front end. He gets the job done in the Gulfstream Park Heartacre Mile. Pays $26.20 on top. Always dreaming in his return to the races, run second, four dollars forty cents to place, and Tommy Macho, the other Pletcher entrant, two dollars eighty cents to show. The one dollar exact a one two comes back forty eight twenty. The fifty cent trifecta comes back seventy three seventy, and the ten cent superfecta one two five six comes back forty five dollars ninety six cents. Conquest Big E is five of twenty lifetime, over three hundred ninety three thousand dollars in career earnings, owned by Daniel C. Hertock. Trained by Donna Green, her talk. Bred by Gainesway Thoroughbreds Limited in Kentucky. Ridden to victory by Jose Batista. And you see the pedigree at the bottom of the page. He's by Tappet out of a Carson City mare named Cian's Believin'. 100 buyer speed figure for Conquest Big E in this front running score in the Gulfstream Park Mile. 122 time form. U.S. rating came home in 25 and 4. Always dreaming the runner up, a 95 buyer, a 117 time form U.S. rating. And again, he came home as well as 25 and 4. Tommy Macho, probably a little bit too much to do coming from so far back, as well as Paige McKinney. They both earned 92 buyers. Uh, Tommy Macho with a 113 time form U.S. rating. Paige McKinney with a 112. Uh, the big story in here was always dreaming coming back to the races, and I think he ran fine. Not as well as the winner. Conquest Big E is a horse, and his connections talked about it. If you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. The problem is he's just had some really rough goes of it recently. The instructions were clear. Get to the front. Let this horse run. He did that. He's very, very talented. I don't know that I would consider him a grade one caliber runner. I don't know that the Met Mile is necessarily something that would work for him because they're probably going to go a heck of a lot faster than 23 and 2, 45 and 4 for a half mile, 110 flat. But I think he's a really nice horse. I think if you can find spots for him, and now he's graded, he's a graded winner, there's no reason not to continue and think that he's going to be a nice horse. He's not going to be a stallion because he's already a gelding. But he can make money. He can be very, very useful going forward. As for always dreaming, I think if you tempered the enthusiasm and didn't think anything other than a win would be a disappointment, you've got to look at this and say, this was okay. Um, it could have been better, but it could have been a hell of a lot worse. He, I don't think he ran poorly. I don't think it was an awesome effort. And usually 
Gulfstream, Todd's playground. They're going to come back off long layoffs and run really well. He ran well. Uh, he's going to need to take a step forward if he's going to be considered a serious, serious player as far as the older horses are concerned. But all things considered, it could have been worse. It could have been an effort like what we got from Irish War Cry. Hate to pile on, but this horse, I didn't love the way that he finished in that run two starts back. I believe it was the Hal's Hope when he didn't go by economic model and top of the lane looked like he had a full head of steam and he just didn't go by and he flattened out bad down the lane. Sure, maybe he needed one. This was just an unmitigated disaster. He was never at any point really all that good. Now you've got to put him away for a little while. I, I think I'm at the point now where I would like to see him on turf. I'd like to see you try to see what you can do with this pedigree. He's by Curl, and there's a lot of turf on the bottom side. See what you can get out of this horse in a middle distance, mile and a 16th, mile and an eighth kind of race on the grass, because right now it's just not working, and I don't know where he is going forward from a confidence standpoint. You've gone through all your conditions. I think you got to shake it up, and you maybe maybe it's an equipment change or maybe it's a surface change for a horse like Irish War Cry. Hopefully he comes back and everything is all good and he's sound and healthy. But Conquest Big E. Finally got a favorable pace situation, a favorable trip. He gets the job done, winning the Gulfstream Park Hardacre Mile. 110, or I'm sorry, 100. Buyer speed figure winning this race. Last race we'll do a recap for here on the Matt Burner Your Show, the recap edition. We'll dive into the Gulfstream Park Oaks. This is for three-year-old Phillies going a mile and 16th on the main track. Let's take a look at the field. No one was scared away. 11 lined up in here. This has been a division in South Florida all winter that has been very lackluster. Uh, it just, there was really no superstar. Nobody was running fast. And really the trend continued on Saturday afternoon. The favorite come post time was take charge Paula. That's kind of all you need to know. Take charge Paula was the known commodity. She's going to run a mid or a high 70. Seemed very unlikely that all of a sudden she would jump up to a, a high 80 or a low 90. And if you're looking at horses, possibly for the Kentucky Oaks, I'm not sure that you found one. There is a nice one in here, though, and it was the winner. Here's the stretch run. Coach Rocks getting the job done. Third, and they're at the top of the stretch. Take charge, Paula. Now re-breaks again and opens up by two and a half. Coach Rocks takes a final run out around the outside. Coach Rocks trying to get to take charge, Paula. She is, and this is going to get close. They run to the first line with Coach Rocks overhauling take charge, Paula to win. Coach Rocks wins the Gulfstream Park Oaks, pays $7.60 on top. Take Charge Paula runs second, $3.60 to place. And the number nine, Princess Warrior, runs third, $3 to show. The $1 exacta comes back $12. Even the 50 cent trifecta 239 comes back $18.35. And the 10 cent superfecta comes back $84.63. Three year old Philly is Coach Rocks. She is two of eight lifetime. She has ripped off consecutive victories. She over $225,000 in career earnings, owned by Roddy J. Valente, RAP Racing, and West Point Thoroughbreds, trained by Dale Romans, bred by Calumet Farm in the state of Kentucky, ridden to victory by Luis Saez, and the pedigree at the bottom is Oxbow out of an El Prado mare named Mexican Moonlight. Here's the problem. As visually impressive as it was, and she overcame a lot, she got a lot out of it, I think, being in behind horses really for the first time, having to come out angle wide, being shuffled on the far turn, and finished really, really well a little late with that lead change. But the 80 buyer is just not nearly fast enough to be considered a contender for the Kentucky Oaks, the 105 time form US rating. It's not there. You're going to need to run a heck of a lot faster in the next four weeks or find some sort of speed. And I just don't know that that's possible at this point in her career. I think she's nice. Clearly, there's some versatility here, and she can overcome some adversity. But at the same time, man, I. Unless she jumps up to like a 95, I, I can't see her winning the Kentucky Oaks. I think she's a nice horse, but I think this is just, this sums up the South Florida Phillies for the 2017, 2018 campaign down at Gulfstream. They're just not that fast. There's a couple of talented ones, but, and who knows, maybe down the road, they can be good. But right now, as visually impressive as that was, was it impressive because it was an awesome performance, like a horse like Mind Your Biscuits or a horse like Mendelssohn that we looked at earlier, or... Was it because she wasn't beating anything and there wasn't anything in the field and she was allowed to, not allowed, but she was, she could do what she did because of what she was running against. It just, it, it's hard for me to get super excited about this horse. I think she's very talented. I think there is some ability here, but as far as the Kentucky Oaks is concerned, I have my doubts. The 80 buyer is certainly going to need to be improved upon uh, for what it's worth. The fastest time form us rating in the field actually was earned by take charge Paula with the one Oh six, considering she was the one that was out there on the front end throughout. So coach rocks gets the job done in the Gulfstream park. Oaks one Oh five time form us rating 80 buyer speed figure.
Unfortunately, because we have gone on so long with some of those bigger races earlier on, we're going to have to throw the rest of the entire crop into the stakes montage this week, including the Pan American, including the Honey Fox. I'll have quick comments about both of those when we come back out of that. After we do the montage, we'll dive in to the weekend's best as far as buyer speed figures are concerned, and then we'll get you ready for what's on deck for the rest of the week here on DRF TV. But first things first, let's get into the stakes montage. The slam and they wheel for home. Hi, happy. Now let loose for the drive and moves away by a length. One go. All go. Tries to stay on second. Late run inside from Classic Covey. Sadler's joy is too late. Inside the final 16th of a mile, it's Gulfstream's leading jockey. Hi, happy. Under Louis Saez to win it by three in the end. He'll have to fan to the center and they're at the top of the stretch. Lull still's going. Lull still in front of the eighth pole by three. Into the clear and coming on. Ras Ipsa from last. She's had all this pace to chase. And here she comes now. Final 16th of a mile. Lull on leave. Res zips it's surging. Res zips on the outside of Lull. Lull digging. It's a photo fit. Full of luck's gone as they come off the turn. Then comes Editori. He's making a serious run and Flamboyant's coming up the inside. Furlong left to go in the mile. Here comes Editore and they're Flamboyant. They're moving as a team. Editore Flamboyant. Here comes a late run from Camino del Paraiso. Coming on late, but it's Flamboyant. Flamboyant rides to the front. And for home on top, got Stormy into the clear and on the attack. Emmer Tomb has inside position and she's going to try to fire through down the outside in Ferdinanda. Less than an eighth of a mile to go and got Stormy up to the throat latch of Figuerella's queen. Ferdinanda charging hard on the outside. Here's Ferdinanda with a late lunge. Here's the finish. Photo finish. With the lead, it's still on the inside, Salmanazar to the attack speed. Franco unleashed by Jose Ortiz to take the lead. On the far outside, Therapist begins to roll home. Speed Franco and Therapist is charging hard. Therapist getting to Speed Franco. Speed Franco needs the wire. Therapist needs to get up, and he will. Therapist is in time. Take the lieutenant, who's hemmed in at the moment by Clear the Mine, and Cat Burglar on the outside has dropped away. He's struggling fourth. Dr. Door leads mid-stretch. Two lengths, Clear the Mine and the lieutenant. Dr. Dr. Door is going strongly for Talamo. Hand ride. Dr. Door is going to win the Santana Mile with a plum. Dr. Door four lengths. The lieutenant second in front of Clear the Mine. As far as the Pan American is concerned, high happy. This is probably what he's wanted to do all along, go long on turf. This was really his first opportunity here in the United States to do that. That little tactical speed that he's got where he can sit just off or he can go to the lead that makes him very dangerous a 105 buyer speed figure for high happy winning that race and as far as the honey fox is concerned really a big big effort from Lowell considering she was the one out there setting just crazy crazy fractions and she still had something left in the tank it was a big effort from her big effort from Rizipsa coming off of the bench coming from out of it but she had the better as far as the pace scenario is concerned sounds like for Lull, the overall game plan and the goal is to get to the grade one just a game on the Belmont Stakes undercard so, and the rest of the other stakes that we saw in that montage, some good efforts there, including Flamboyant, finally getting back to the winner's circle up at Golden Gate in the San Francisco Mile. Let's dive into the weekend's best performances from a buyer speed figure standpoint, as we always do here on the recap edition of the Matt Bernier Show. Again, it depends. doesn't matter age, doesn't matter uh, sex, doesn't matter surface, doesn't matter distance. We got it all covered for you here. So without further ado, let's take a look at that graphic. You can see the three-year-old males, the best performance from a buyer standpoint of the weekend, Audible winning the Florida Derby with a 99 buyer. Three-year-old females, Coach Rocks. We were a little bit light again on the weekend as far as the girls are concerned. 80 buyer winning the Gulfstream Park Oaks. Three-year-old males on turf. Therapist gets the job done in the Cutler Bay with a 91 buyer. Three-year-old fillies. Three-way photo finish in the Sanibel Island. They all earned the same buyer speed figure. Figuerella's Queen, Ferdinanda, and Got Stormy. They all earned 84 buyer speed figures. Older male, Conquest Big E with a 100 buyer winning the Gulfstream Park Heartacre Mile. The older females, just the girls in general, were a little bit light on dirt this week. Uh, Shortcakes, 88 buyer, and the extra heat up at Aqueduct that was on their sort of claiming crown day. Older males on turf just spoke about High Happy winning the Pan American with a 105 buyer and also just spoke about Lull winning the Honey Fox with a 95 buyer speed figure. There they are. Those are the weekend's best performances from a buyer speed figure sta- <laughs> buyer speed figure scale. Say that one three times fast. All of them dominated by the action down at Gulfstream Park this past weekend. So, again, as we always do, we'll give you the best performances from the weekend prior here on the recap edition of the Matt Bernier Show. Let's take a look at the DRF-TV schedule of events for what's to come this week. 
Now, they have drawn opening day at Keeneland already. The Saturday card will be drawn on Tuesday, so you will have plenty of time to dive in. And those stakes previews will be up on Wednesday on video.drf.com, as well as the Daily Racing Forms YouTube channel. If you are listening to this on YouTube, you should click on that subscribe button on the Daily Racing Forms channel. So we will have bluegrass stakes, Ashland, all that. That'll be up on Wednesday a little bit earlier than most of the other videos. You'll have the Saturday DRF Bets race of the day, which is the Santa Anita Derby. The defection of McKinsey because of injury. Insert justify. So we'll have a showdown between him and Bolt Doro. And then also on Saturday, you'll have races like the Wood Memorial and a number of other graded stakes all across the country. You always have the Derby Watch between Jay Privman and Mike Watchmaker. They will be going through and talking about the Derby prep races coming up. And again, these are some of the final 100-point prep races as well. You'll have a couple of DRF bet spot plays. You'll have DRF formulator angles. You'll have a little bit of this, a little bit of that. If you get ready for Friday, prepping for that big weekend coming up at 11 o'clock, you've got the DRF Players Podcast with Peter Thomas Fornital and Jonathan Kinchin. At noon, you've got the Matt Bernier Show, the preview edition. We'll dive into all sorts of action all across the country. Again, graded stakes galore on Saturday afternoon. And as we always do, we will lead into the latest edition of Out of the Gate, all of the usual suspects on Out of the Gate, all of our good handicappers, writers, and reporters, contributors all across the country from the Daily Racing Forum. They will be on Out of the Gate this week, getting you ready for big racing from Aqueduct, Santa Anita, and Keeneland. Opening weekend down in Lexington, Kentucky, Keeneland Racecourse this weekend. If you've been listening to this live, thank you for doing so. Live.drf.com, livestream.com, the Daily Racing Forms Twitter handle, that would be at DRF Inside Post, as well as the Daily Racing Forms Facebook page. If you have been listening to this in podcast form, as most of you do, YouTube, video.drf.com, iTunes, SoundCloud. If you want to follow me on Twitter, questions, comments, concerns, want to talk about any of these races, at Bernie or underscore Matt on Twitter, usually pretty good about trying to respond to some things when they come out. Uh, We will talk again on Friday with the preview edition of the Matt Bernier Show. This show will be back next Tuesday. We'll be recapping those three big Kentucky Derby preps, as well as some of the other big stakes races all across the country. Until then, however you're playing, whatever you're playing, whatever you're playing, best of luck. Chat again soon. The Matt Bernier Show.